All right, get out your Bibles, and we're going to uh, jump into part two of our lesson from last week. Um, we are in John chapter three. We're doing the story of Nicodemus. Of course, our series is in, is encounters with Jesus, as Jesus encounters different people, and both from a practical sense and from what is it we're supposed to learn out of these stories. And we started this lesson last week with this guy named Nicodemus, a man who was very well versed in the Old Testament. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the leading group among the Jews. He came to Jesus at night. And we talked about how he had to overcome the narrative of his world. Because everything in his world was telling him to reject Jesus. But this guy made it through that. And then we spent most of the rest of the time last week talking about what it means to be born again and how Jesus defines that. And it's not just a little makeover that we do in our lives, but it is literally our lives are born all over again. And we start anew uh, with Jesus. We're going to pick up in verse 6. Really, let's, let's pick up in verse 5 because... This is where we left off last week. It says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God. Remember, what we are after is citizenship in the kingdom of God. We have a king. We live not in a democracy. We live in a kingdom. We are not of this world Uh, The Hebrew writer says we are aliens and strangers in this world looking forward to a country that God has made for us, His kingdom. But the kingdom of God has been revealed in, in different ways along the way. The fullness of the kingdom of God will come in what we just sang about. Someday we will live in its fullness. But Jesus, when He came, brought a part of that kingdom to the world. And, of course, they were thinking earthly, and Jesus says, you know what, nobody's ever going to get into my kingdom unless they are born of water, rebirthed, baptized, and the last part of that verse, and the Spirit. So that's where we're going to pick up today. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit. Now we looked at this verse last week in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. The day that entrance into that kingdom was available to, to the people who were there, they asked, What do we need to do? And Peter replies, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So there is the rebirth in water, and our sins are forgiven. But then here's what he says next. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Boy, see, it's not just that God says, okay, if you're going to be in my kingdom, Nicodemus, and think about who Nicodemus was. He says, Nicodemus, even you are going to have to be born again. I know you're a smart guy. I know you're a religious leader. But you're going to have to to, to totally get rid of all that thinking. And you're going to have to be born again. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the power to do it. You see, this is not a bootstrap religion where we just say, all right, I got to totally make my life over. God says, no, I will give you my spirit. You see, man by himself is nothing but flesh. He is limited by who he is. And none of us are that good. When the spirit is given to us, we are given a greater power than we have. Now, his response to this, and by the way, This is why I love face-to-face interactions because I got a pretty good idea what happens in this scripture. Though we may not have the whole conversation, in verse 7, after Jesus has said, you got to be born of the Spirit to get in the kingdom. The next verse, 
Jesus speaking says, you should not be surprised at my saying. What do you think happened there? There you go, Bev Cain, I see her over there. She just did exactly like, that was my Bev imitation right there. There had to have been a look on his face of surprise, of confusion, of what in the world do you mean, Jesus, about this total starting over and that I got to be born of the Spirit. Now, by the way, as a teacher of the law, he should have already known that. God had already said, Ezekiel chapter 36, let's read that, verses 25 through 27. God says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Does that ring with that water theme again of baptism? And he says, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You're Israel's teacher. You're so familiar with the law. This is nothing new that I'm telling you. You must be born again. And now what appears to happen in this story is you can see the confusion in Nicodemus. He's going, but I don't get it. I I don't understand how that could work. I mean, how is this thing going to enter into me that's going to help me with your laws, your decrees, and to be this different person? And so Jesus uses a very simple illustration. He uses the wind. Now think about the wind. There are days that the wind is really, really calm, right? And you can barely know it's there, maybe a gentle little breeze. And then there are days like we have, you know, the last few days where we have these big old thunderstorms come through and the wind blows the trees and everything's a little crazy. And Jesus says, well, that's kind of how the Spirit is. You know it's there because you see the effects of it. Some days the wind blows very gently and it, it, it's almost as it may, you would think it's not there. And then other days, buddy, whoo, think of the day of Pentecost when the sound of a mighty rushing wind comes in. You knew it was there. And yet there are other days that it's not. And Jesus says that's how the Spirit is. It's going to work in different ways and in different times in people's life. Think about uh, stuff we do and use all the time. I've got brothers here doing all this great technology stuff so we can be live here and there are computer screens and monitors and cameras and all that. I dare say, I'll set this guy right here and I can probably give you a fairly good explanation of it since my first degree was in computer science. My question is, can you tell me how that computer works, how that TV works? Can you tell me how electricity really works? A few could, but most of us, we just flip on a switch and use it. That's what Jesus is saying in this passage. He says, Nicodemus, it's not up for you to understand all the ways in your life that the Spirit will work. You just got to know that is the gift I've put into your life. And it is so powerful. You're not on your own. Okay? Now, before I move on, let me, let me make, uh, I knew I was going to talk about this week, and I sort of had this in mind last week, but it may be unclear what I was saying about something last week. So let me see if I can clear that up just a little bit. Last week when we were talking about the narratives that we listen to, and a lot of things that people are watching and listening to, and a lot of things being sent to me, I said, hey guys, I don't want that. Now here's what I mean by that. By that means, I don't want to train my mind with the narrative of the world. I want to train my mind with the things of the Spirit. It's not that we can't learn. It's not that we can't learn. And if anything, what I want is, I want my brothers and sisters who have the Spirit of Jesus in them, help me, teach me, let's talk, let's be together in this. I hope you see the difference in those. One is not... Shut down, I don't want to hear that. No, not at all. But let's all make sure 
that we're training our minds and we're listening to the Spirit of God, not just the narrative of the world out there, okay? All right, so Jesus says, here you go, Nicodemus, I'm going to give you my spirit. But then there's an interesting verse. He starts at, in verse 9, Nicodemus says, how can this be? Jesus gives him that little rebuke we just talked about. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? You should. You, you should know this. I've illustrated it with a simple illustration with him. How can you not get this? Now verse 11, and this is, I think, one of the missed verses in this whole section of Scripture. I tell you the truth. Notice this word. We speak of what we know. And we testify to what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. Wow, there's a great lesson in that. Here's the way I'm going to put it up. The reborn life must be experienced. Here's what Jesus is saying in this. You notice the we and the you people. Now this is Jesus talking. Who is the we? Jesus and his disciples. Now stop for just a second. I know this is not long into his ministry, but buddy, they've already seen enough, right? I mean, they started walking with him when he met them by the, by the ocean and he called them to follow him. They've been into Cana of Galilee. They watched him turn water into wine. They saw a bunch of other miracles. We don't know what all those were, but it says they performed many miracles. They saw him go into the temple and tear that place apart. And they noted, zeal for my father's house will consume They've already seen the Spirit of God at work in Jesus. And so what Jesus is contrasting, he's like, Nicodemus, here's your problem. You sit around all the time at the synagogue and you talk and you talk and you talk. Me and my disciples, we go out and we experience it. We do it. We're with the people. And and you guys, you, you, you sit around for hours and you just... You know, you you speak of all your philosophies and your teachings and your understandings. What you're missing, Nicodemus, why this stuff doesn't make sense to you, is it's all an intellectual truth to you. Boy, that's a great practical message for us, isn't it? I hear a lot of people today, you know, I want God, but I don't need the church. I'm just going to say, that is, that is biblically speaking, and this word is used in the Bible, so I'm going to say it, that's ignorant. You're missing the whole purpose. God is saying to us, the experience of living in the Bible, of, of living among God's people, of living in my family, is the very thing that is going to convince you of how the Spirit works in other people's lives. You watch them change. You watch the Spirit. That's ridiculous to think that you're going to live on your own. You're missing out on one of the greatest things I've put in your life so that you can experience it and go, this is not just some, you know, little gentle wind blowing out there. Wow, I have seen the winds of change in other people's lives. Uh, I know I think I've shared this, it might have been a while, but I'm going to share a little bit of a part of my story um, that I think illustrates this point. Uh, As many of you know, my first degree was in computer science, and right as I was getting that degree, I decided that I really liked the idea. I had worked as a summer intern in youth and family ministry, and so I really decided I wanted to go back and get my degree in theology, which I did. And all along, I was working for a church, and then after my degree, uh, I was to uh, go to that church and work full-time. I worked full-time during the summer, part-time while getting the degree, and was going back. Lynn and I were engaged to be married, and, um, you know, life's little plan is all laid out. It's all great and hunky-dory. There was...
were some things within that church. It wasn't all one thing, um, but there were two, maybe two big things that had come out, and I had called attention to one of them already, which is there was uh, a leader in the church who, who happened to be the uh, treasurer of the church, and he was paying himself money and thought, since I do this job, I, I deserve money for it, but nobody in the church knew it. So I guess he made that decision on his own, and I called attention to that. And then uh, in this particular church, we met Sunday morning and Sunday night. We had a service on Sunday night, and one Sunday night, uh, as we were greeting people at the door and the church service was beginning, a black couple walked into our church building. Now, this is in Mississippi, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't think anything about it. I grew up. Uh, that, that wasn't a big deal to me at all, um, but it was an all-white church. And uh, I welcomed them at the door and smiled and said, come on in, we're just getting started. And next thing I know, uh, one of the elders of the church comes, I won't say he was running because he was an older fellow, but he was making his way pretty fast, and he stopped them just inside the door, and he said, um, we built a church for your kind down the road. We think you would be much happier there. Now, that was one of my first real, I didn't grow up around a lot of that. And for me, that was huge. I, I was dumbfounded. I was shocked. I didn't know what to say. This is my elder. I'm a young, you know, just getting out of college age. Uh, but I, I later that night confronted it, and I got fired right before we were to get married. Now, let me say a couple things. Not saying that to go, whoo, look at Rick, he's so awesome. He's No, not at all. It hurt. It was ugly. Um, the word disillusion comes to mind. You can imagine being, I just got my degree in Bible. I'm ready to go into the ministry. I'm in the ministry, and I just lost my first job just trying to do what I know the Bible says is right. I'm nothing special. You can imagine how disillusioned you become. And I contrast that to two or three years later, and there's some other parts of that story that were good. Some things that happened after that. I got hired at another place, met some people from from the church in Crossroads, uh, Gainesville, Florida, where I was born, and saw something in them that, wow, I like these people. And about three years later or so, I got to visit our sister church in New York City, back when it was pretty small, a couple of hundred people. But what I saw there was white, black, Latino, everybody having an amazing time and and the first thoughts in my mind were, wow, this is a little uncomfortable because I hadn't seen it, but it's so powerful because it's what I see in my Bible. And it helped me then with that disillusionment, that, that one picture that was stuck in my mind of this is not the way it's supposed to be to see it in action. And you go, ah. Oh. You've got to experience it. That's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you can't just go to the synagogue and have a bunch of discussions. you got to get out there, live it, do it, be there with other people different than you, learn from each other, be real community, and a lot of that disillusionment will go away. And you'll begin to see things on a depth. The Spirit will lead you to see things on a depth. You're not seeing. My appeal to some of you who, who you seem to want to just live away from God and His church and people, you, you got to come inside the doors and you got to live it. You will not find a perfect people. Man, we're having to work through a lot right now, right? The world's trying to tear, tear us apart. And don't you know Satan then would want to get in the church and try to tear us apart as well. But we love his kingdom too much. That is a part of what we learn in all of this. It's how the Spirit works in our lives. 
you got to see it. You got to live it. You got to experience it. All right, let's go to the third part, which is the most famous verse in the Bible. I knew we'd eventually get there, right? Everybody knows this one. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now, we could take weeks to talk about this verse. The main theme of what he's saying here is this. The nature, the heart, the intent of God is to save. That's who God is. And there's those famous two words. So loved. That's the core of the gospel. It is the message of who God is. What is driving God to do this? He so loved us. Now, a lot of people read this, and sometimes we, we make it say something. It's nice. See, there's not going to be any condemnation of anybody. It's not what he says. In fact, he goes on to make it very clear Here's the deal. If you're going to be rejected by God and you're going to be judged, you're going to do that yourself. That's why he could say, I didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn it. I sent Jesus to save it. But if you reject him, you're, you're condemning yourself. That's not, that's not my job. And so you've got to be careful with that because Jesus later says, I came to condemn. I came to bring condemnation into the world. It all depends on whose point of view you're looking at it from. That's all that is. It's not a contradiction. From a mankind point of view, I'm going to, if I go to hell, I go to hell because Rick Overturf chooses to go to hell by rejecting Jesus Christ. And Jesus would say, I didn't come for that. You see? And so, Jesus is presenting the motivation here. He's saying, it's all because God so loved you. Now, let's don't skip over the other very radical thing that Jesus says in this verse, and let's be honest, this, this, is, um, this is the most controversial thing that we live in today. And that is, He clearly says He is the one and the only Son of God. The exclusivity of Jesus. Boy, that is not politically correct in our day, is it? Let's, let's um, you know, let's say it like it is. If you're going to be born again and you're going to follow Jesus, you have to reject every other religion in the world besides Christianity. It is exclusive. It is, what did Jesus say? It is the truth. Not a truth, the truth. No one comes to the Father, but by me. Now, here's what that also does not say. It doesn't mean we need to treat people with ugliness or contempt. In fact, we need to do the opposite. We need to love them and we need to show them Jesus to win them over. But it's always going to have to start with a deep, deep conviction. There is a one and there is an only and that is Jesus. All right, now let's get to the last part. And this is a part we don't preach a whole lot to. I love how people read John 3.16. And it's an awesome verse and it's, it's the heart of the gospel. But I want to look at a word. If you look down, well, let's read it together. Starting in verse 19. He says, this is the verdict. Now think about all he's been talking about. This whole idea of being born again, having a spirit in our lives, uh, God loving us so much that he, He's paved the way. But then He ends this little discourse. He ends His encounter with Nicodemus by saying, Now this 
is the verdict. What's a verdict? I'm getting feedback, by the way, from y'all say it out real loud through the TV and maybe it'll come through. It's, um, it's a judgment. It's a decision. When you have a trial and you've heard all sides, a verdict is given and then it's pronounced. And so Jesus, in talking to Nicodemus, says, all right, Nicodemus, now you've heard all this, but here's what it comes down to. All right, here's the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Man, we read this and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Every one of us understands that. Why do you think so much crime, so much sin happens at night? Because we don't want to be exposed. We're like the little roaches, you know. We want to run around at night. Boy, somebody begins to shine the light into it. We all run and we go, oh man, you know, I'm embarrassed. And so Jesus lays out, lays out. here's what it's going to come down to. It's as simple as this. Are you going to live in light or are you going to live in darkness? Now let me point out something here. There are times that we get exposed. We're running around, you know, when I go into my garage at night and I flick the light on, there are these little, you know, I got some big old, what do you call those, big old roaches, palmetto bugs or whatever they're called, and, and they're running around happy and free and doing whatever, but when I turn the light on, I don't think they were going, I hope somebody comes in and, no, they run. And you know what, that's happened to me and I know it's happened to you. Where you got caught or somebody shined the light into your life and it's not fun and we get exposed and what we do with that, it's not all bad, right? I mean, sometimes praise God that somebody brings us into the light, but I don't even think that's what he's talking about here. That's why I'm bringing that up. This is a choice to live in the light. Now, praise God when we get exposed, prayerfully it leads us to repentance but what he's saying is, you got to choose to come into the light. you got to choose to live that way. That's what's going to be the verdict in this story. Are you willing, Nicodemus? Now, can you, can you see what Jesus is doing here? The play that he... Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And he concludes this by going, hey, Nicodemus. Can't live in the shadows, buddy. Can't be a silent follower. You're going to have to come out. You're going to have to come into the light. But let me tell you, it's going to be great when you live free. And one of the saddest stories, and the Hebrew writer writes about it, is how we try to live in the light and go around following Jesus all along while we're dragging the sin of the past. The Hebrew writer said, let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles. Quit dragging it with you through life. He wants us to live free, to live in the light. I'll close with this little illustration of it. Uh, you ever seen one of the stories that comes out over the internet or somewhere, you know, and somebody's committed a crime in their life, and perhaps it was a really, really bad crime in their life. And they got away with it at least got away with it from the law. Just read one the other day. I wish I'd, wish I'd gotten it. But a guy committed a crime, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. It was a very serious crime. But he turned himself in. He's in his 70s, I believe it was. And he turned himself in. For the crime, and he's going to spend probably the rest of his life in jail. But he said, I couldn't stand myself anymore. There is a freedom that comes with living in the light. There is a guilt and a shame that comes with living in darkness. And what Jesus is offering Nicodemus is, Nicodemus... I want you free of that. I want you to be born all over again, 
God loves you that much. He doesn't want to condemn you. Don't condemn yourself by living in darkness. Come on out into the light and live free. Cool thing about this story is we know more of the story. You know, some of these encounters so far, we've been like, I don't know. We never hear from him again in the Bible. We hear from him two more times in the Bible, and both of them give you every reason to believe he came into the light and lived life as a disciple. We find him again, I believe it's in John 7, where the Sanhedrin is meeting, and they're, they're trying to kill Jesus and condemning, and he steps up and he says, whoa, 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 time out. Does it even our own law say? And he's defending Jesus. And then you remember what happens at the end of Jesus' life? John chapter 19, two men, Joseph of Arimathea, and, and, and I love how, how John records it, Nicodemus, the man that came to Jesus at night. You know, it's, the guy, it's what he's known for, but he actually buries Jesus. He got the message. He came into the life. He lived it. Jesus set him free. Free from that crazy narrative of that religion that was just in, in, enslaving him to a really true freeing encounter with Jesus. He'll do the same for us. What a great encounter. Uh, Gary and Lisa Hundley, Gary's one of our elders, is going to come up and they're going to close out our time together. Love you guys. Thank you. Let's keep studying the word together.